Okay, and it looks like we are live. Hello and welcome to our viewers. My name is Raven Clark and I'm the Satellite Program Coordinator at the Jefferson. For this afternoon's digital program titled The American Tapestry, 1968 and 2022, The Seeds of Our Discontent, I'm joined by our presenters, Dr. Phil Payne of St. Bonaventure University, JES Vice President, Mr. Ben Spagan, and JES Scholar in Residence, Dr. Andrew Roth. Dr. Roth is a Jefferson Scholar in Residence focused on leadership, media, and social studies. He designed, built, and facilitates the Ramey Fellowship Program, which was launched in 2018. He is the author of more than 100 book notes, a superb weekly publication series that has gained traction beyond our county limits. I'd like to note here that he's, note here that his accomplished career in academics, from lecturing to leading as he taught various courses on leadership before going on to serve in administrations in Erie, to lead Notre Dame College in Cleveland and as its president and president emeritus and at St. Bonaventure University as interim president. So without further ado, I would like to give this over to Dr. Roth. Thank you, Raven, uh, and welcome everyone. Uh, my, as Raven said, my name's uh, Andy Roth and I've been working on this project with Phil Payne and Ben Spagan for quite a while. And we're uh, really excited to share with you some thoughts and observations on what we're calling the seeds of our discontents, which is a kind of umbrella topic for a number of topics. In any event, uh, as Raven said, my name is Andrew Roth, Andy Roth. I'm a scholar in residence at the Jefferson Educational Society. Uh, Co-presenting with me today are Phil Payne, who is a professor of history and chair of the Department of History at St. Bonaventure University. Uh, Phil teaches undergraduate courses in public and digital history and a variety of courses in American history. Phil is also the author of Dead Last, the Public Memory of Warren G. Harding's Scandalous Legacy, which came out in 2009, and Crash, How the Economic Boom and Bust of the 1920s Worked. Uh, Phil has also published a number of things on popular culture and using popular culture, films, music, and comic books as a window into American culture. Uh, ben Spagan, of course, is no stranger to uh, Jefferson audiences, and, and Ben has been immersed in much of this material with me over the last two years. Uh, today, uh, Ben is actually a, co a contributor, and I'm looking forward to his insights. Uh, just very briefly, for those of you who might not be uh, regular Jefferson viewers, Ben is the vice president of the Jefferson Educational Society. He also serves as the editorial director of the R Towns Civic Foundation and is a contributing editor of the Erie Reader. Ben has taught at the college level and for a time hosted a community affairs program on WQLN, NPR public television and public radio in Northwest Pennsylvania. A native of Morgantown, West Virginia, Ben actually grew up in Carmichael's, Pennsylvania. He studied literature and history at Gannon University where he received both his bachelor's and master's degree. So welcome gentlemen. And this afternoon we're going to discuss uh, the seeds of our discontent and I'd like to make a comment to our audience. Uh, I'm going to be tracking this. I think Raven will also be tracking this for us on Facebook. Uh, we're really particularly interested in your questions and comments. Uh, and we also understand you know, that as we speak today, there may only be 30 or 40 or 50 people actually monitoring this, but we also know over time that number will grow into the oh, 150 to 200 range. And so if you're watching this at a later date, uh, we would still uh, welcome any questions because I'll monitor the website. Uh, I suspect Phil and uh, Ben will also, or the Facebook page, and we'll um, actually uh, respond to you even later. So if you're watching it later, not in real time, please please don't feel that you can't ask a question or, or make a comment. Uh, particularly, uh, I'm interested in comments that might think perhaps uh, that uh, we're not right. I'm always interested in people who have a, a different take on what we're going to talk about. Uh, speaking about what we're going to talk about, uh, a quick agenda is uh, we're going to talk about the seeds of our discontents. And I use that metaphor because I want to look at, or we want to look at how in American history, where in American history are the roots of our current polarized Ameri uh, political and in many ways cultural. And it'd be an interesting question whether the 
political polarization generated the cultural polarization or whether the cultural polarization preceded the political and has in fact uh, generated that. Uh, and as we're going to discover, uh, these seeds, these roots go way back in American history. But to give ourselves some kind of uh, leaping off point, if you will, hopefully it's not leaping off, uh, some kind of launch point, uh, we tend to look at what is, how did 2022 emerge out of what's generally called or lumped into one cliched phrase, the 60s. Uh, if you talk to most people who today, particularly uh, people on the right, uh, but not only, who, who say that American culture went off the rails, they'll say it all began in the 60s and not necessarily being very specific about what they mean by that. And so we'll kind of look at that decade and one year in particular as a hinge year, but we're not saying that all of this occurred because of the 60s because many of the things we're talking about, their roots go back uh, to the beginning of American history at whatever date you wanna say that history began. So in any event, we're gonna look at the background, what I call meta threads, politics as theater and angry partisanship, race in America, the women's movement in the late 60s morphs into women's liberation and the counterculture and the counter counterculture, music mediated America and something I call fusion thread. And, how we're going to proceed is I'll make a couple of comments or two and then ask Ben and Phil um, for that to elaborate or you know perhaps even to point out areas where I, I may be off base. So let's um, let's begin. And as I begin, I mentioned, you know, I think I probably already answered why 1968 and why 1968 is somewhat of an arbitrary choice, but my interest in all of this, and I've said this before, and it's one of the reasons I'm really uh, pleased to have Phil with us today. My interest in all of this began standing in, um, you would think after, I would remember, it's only been five, four or five, it's only been five or six years since the conversation. Uh, but we were standing in a, the hallway at, at St. Bonaventure outside of Phil's office, and we got talking about in 2016, I think this was the fall of, right around the presidential election, we got talking about uh, why is everything so fractious? And I made the observation, we, there, no one knows what, there's a big disagreement about what constitutes the American story. And Phil pointed out to me that, well, in two years, 2018 is the 50th anniversary of 1968. And so that set me down a path uh, and Ben has been with me on a lot of this path. We did a, I did a series, America in 1968, the American Tapestry, American Holidays, and all of that came out of that conversation in the hallway outside of Phil's office. And so what we want to talk about today is, that's why 1968, and it's also, granted 1968 is becoming looked upon or has already become looked upon as one of the major years in American history, but it's not so much 1968. It's a convenient marker as a year for the 60s uh, as a cultural phenomenon. What has happened since then? What happened prior to that that led to all the things that happened that year? And so I've been working on this idea of the American story, and I've, I've, I'm, I'm interested in hearing Phil and Ben's uh, reaction to this. Lately, and this is really just this summer, this spring and summer, I've begun to realize that there are really, you know, there is an argument that there is no such thing as the American story. There are the American stories. I've come to, and I developed a metaphor, and we won't get into warp and woof, but I got into, I developed the metaphor that the story of America is really the tapestry created by the weaving together of many stories. And as a metaphor, that works. But I've come to believe in our fractious times, there really are two American stories. And in many ways, the story of America is the competition between those two stories. Uh, one I call the essentialist story. Uh, the essentialist story says, this is what America is and it can't change. It tends to be white, patriarchal, Christian, exclusionary, uh, and to a certain extent, anti-democratic. But maybe I'd even drop the metaphor to a certain extent because this would go all the way back to the beginning. Um, Phil's more attuned to this than I am, but if you look at early American history, 
a lot of people will say, you know, the whole history of America is the contention between the spirit of 76 and the spirit of 89, by which they mean the democratic spirit of 1776, which the founding fathers with the constitution in 1789 attempted to put back in the bottle. And as recently as this morning, I read an article in a, a major national uh, publication in which a, an opinion writer uh, went all the way back to that. You know, you know that the, the constitution is by design, not democratic, nor is the Senate democratic. That's the essential story. The other story, the story that I think that I tend to favor, to be quite candid, is what I call the protean story. And it's the story of Americans attempt to do two things simultaneously, neither of which are very easy. And in fact, history would tell you, and I'm global history would tell you, uh, both of them are fraught with peril and have historically had mixed results at best or not succeeded. And those two things that the Americans have tried to do is one, to create, uh, to engage in self-government, to engage in what Lincoln called government of the people, by the people, for the people, while simultaneously throughout our entire history, constantly redefining the we and we the people by making it I think as a positive, not everyone agrees, more and more and more inclusive as it includes more and more diverse people from around the world. So those in my mind are the two stories, the major dates in American history. I think one way of getting at them would be at what points in American history do those two stories collide? What points in American history do those two stories diverge? And have there ever been any flashpoints? So I'll ask uh, Ben or Phil, uh, what's your take on my meta threads? I'm talking too much, so I'm stopping. Um, I'll hop in here for a minute and uh, let Ben have a minute to collect his thoughts. Does that work? So anyhow, um, yeah, so I think basically the idea of two stories is a really powerful way of understanding uh, U.S. history, like the, the, the sort of the idea of the United States um, in this sort of big picture intellectual thinking about what is the nature of the American government. Um, reminds me of Potter's idea that, um, uh, that we use Hamiltonian means to Jeffersonian ends. Like we have this constant tension between those two things. Um, and in some ways you're talking here and this is what's popped into my head. It's we've, we've got this capitalist system, this very dynamic economic system and we have a political system that's designed to manage change. And, I, and maybe one of the ways to think about this, and I'm making this up on the spot, so this might be a really bad thought on my part, but is maybe one of the things that happens here is we hit these moments in our time when our social and economic technological change is so rapid that our political system, which is built upon checks and balances and restraint um, and, and balancing these things, our political system just can't keep up with and gets gummed up by the, rapid, the rapidness of our social and economic change. Is that another way of thinking about what you're thinking about? I think that is. Um... That makes sense. I mean, one of the uh, one of the bullet points later, or it's not later, it was on the screen before, but we may or may not get to today. As as Ben has told us a couple of times, we have so much material to cover. I'm not sure how deep we're going to get, and we do have a, a template uh, that we're going to try to follow. But as Phil just pointed out indirectly, all of these topics overlap with one another. But I think, for example, the notion that there was a unified American culture was true at the very beginning, began to come apart under the pressure of immigration in the early and middle 19th century. I'm gonna leap then. And then under the, 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 then in the middle of the 20th century, as a creation of the mass media, we had the illusion and this, I'm not saying that anyone set out to do this. This is a, a, a an unintended consequence of the, ra the rise of recorded music, radio, motion pictures, and then television, it created the sense, uh, some, and it'd be interesting, I, I, just arbitrarily, I'll say 1925, because by 1925, radio was working fairly well. 
uh, but there were only two or three national networks, um, CBS, interestingly enough, and then uh, RCA had a red and blue network, one of which later gets spun off and becomes ABC, but whatever. And then you had uh, motion pictures, and it created this sense because the dominant culture, it created a, a sense that there was this homogeneous culture. You can see on the periphery uh, of, of all of that, you know, immigrants, minorities, etc. And then in the 1950s and 1960s, the, the advent of rock and roll music brings you back to the diverse America. And then of course, technology in the latter part of the 20th century coming up to us undoes that mass media by the fancy word is disintermediates, but it, the better way of saying it is maybe not is fragments it. I don't know. What do you think, Ben? Does that make any sense? So, so I really do, and thank you, Andy, for including me in this program. I get a chance to come out from behind a, a moderating role and uh, be a participant. So I appreciate you, and, and Phil, I appreciate you you bringing uh, all of your experience, history, and knowledge to this as well. So I think where I'm going to come at some of this is a cultural observer, uh, somebody who has studied some history, but also um, uh, been an observer and reporter of it. Uh, and, and I think one of the important things, Andy, I think you've hit right. One, uh, we tend to look at our history and try to make sense with these inflection points. And those tend to be drawn around dates that we can look at and say something changed because we try to look at when did that happen so we can go back and study it and then anticipate where do we move forward. I think back to your metaphor of the weaving, I think an important part here of, of this story and stories is who gets to be a weaver? You know, who is actually participating in that? And over the span of American history, we see more people actually participating in that. And it becomes more challenging because some people feel that their role in the weaving might have been reduced by the inclusion of others. Others might be more welcoming to, to other folks participating in that. But I think that that's one of the challenges. And then the complexity of these threads running together and overlapping. And as Phil had uh, so astutely pointed out, it's sometimes gumming each other up, tying knots or, you know, becoming stretched at points. And that really then ripples down into culture. And, and we see it rippling up, you know, out of politics as well and, and back and forth. So I, I think that it's important to think of the multiple stories, how they intersect with each other, how they play with each other, and then how people are telling those. And, and I, I personally can't help but think of, you know, a, a bumper sticker that I'm sure people have seen before uh, and a yard sign I'm sure people have seen before. The yard sign is the all are welcome here. And I think that's part of an American spirit. And then a bumper sticker I've seen is, you know, the shape of the country and it uses vulgar language to say, you know, essentially we are full, you know, and telling people to get out. And so we have the exclusionist America. We've had enough. This is who we are. We are locked in, in into a definite uh, definition of who we are. And then we have the inclusive, ever evolving, continually being worked on definition of you know continuing to throw open our gates and, and welcome that inclusion of America. And we see them you know coming to coming to heads in in 2022, and, and we've seen it in past years. And of course, that really emanating out of the 60s, which we'll get into. Yeah, yeah, I, I think. I, was gonna on, say, I, on, I think Ben's spot on, and I think it's really important to remember who's at the table when you write the story, um, because it's put it put it this way: it's like maybe one of the things that happens, we think of the American story as being written in the passive voice, but it's really at, written in the active voice. There's somebody writing it, and they're describing their actions, and who gets who gets a who gets a say in that story is a huge part of what we're talking about. Yeah, and that and, is and right really, to, oh, go on, Ben, I'm sorry. Yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, Andy, right, right to Phil's point, you know, and I, and I will get into this, I, and, and Phil touched on it earlier, the technologies of our time just expedite the, the manner in which the story is being recorded and told. You know, we live in the moment now and we live in, in such a, a cycle that moves so quickly uh, that we hadn't experienced before. You know, we had back to the days of only several channels on the radio and only several channels on the television, there was only so much we could consume. It's near infinite at this point, which makes telling the story very complicated because we're just inundated with so many different parts of the story and trying to suss out what is actually part of our story and what is just noise is becoming increasingly difficult. I think you and Phil make a really important point. Um, who gets to tell the story uh, has changed. Uh, and, and, and earlier media, it, you know, it was very limited who, who had access. I mean, if you go back to colonial times, 
Uh, there was media in colonial times. People tend to forget that. Uh, there were pamphlets, uh, sermons, uh, and there were newspapers. In fact, you could argue, it's been argued, newspapers to a certain extent created America. Uh, if you didn't have newspapers, uh, particularly Benjamin Eads, I'm having a, a momentary brain cramp, but I want to say the Boston newsletter, but in the back of my head, there's something telling me that's not exactly the right uh, thing. But I, Benjamin Eade was the editor. I, I can remember him, but I don't remember the name. Uh, and, you know, of course, uh, all up and down the, the, the Atlantic seaboard. And so as you, as you move through history, uh, you move through time, you know, who gets to tell the story is important because they have different points of view and at different times, different, uh, Threads, but I, 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 I think we want to explore this idea as we look at some other things. Uh, you know, the essentialist story. I'm going to go to the Protean story for a moment. In many ways, I'm jumping almost to the end. The history of immigration into the United States follows follows an interesting pattern, and it repeats itself over and over and over again. Uh, and in a, a, a kind of snapshot thing, uh, first group comes. They encounter bitter resentment, whether it's Franklin's resenting the Germans' refusal to learn to speak English in Philadelphia, which is why there's a German town, Pennsylvania, which is now in greater Philadelphia. But when the germ first German immigrants went out to Germantown, it was way out in the country. Uh, and then eventually, some of those first wave of immigrants, they claw their way into American society and establish a beachhead, if you will, to use a bad metaphor. Uh, and their children then become assimilated. Their grandchildren then become the next generation of leaders. They've totally become assimilated. And by the time you get to the grandchildren or the third or fourth generation, the, the cliched version would be, they pull up the ladder and they are now the natives. And they have a nativist reaction against the next wave of immigrants. And that has repeated itself from the earliest colonial times to the, Catholic, the, the, the Catholics during the 1840s and German Catholics in the 1840s to most one of the more extreme examples, uh, Asians, the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, to then of course the great wave of Eastern and Southern European and Eastern Im European immigration. And then today we're seeing some of that with the post-1965 immigration. I actually think at, at the risk of making this somewhat political, I, I don't mean to, but I find uh, uh, our, our, our most recent former president's anti-immigration uh, attitude really kind of startling. His wife was, his first wife and the mother of his children, three of his children is an immigrant. His mother was an immigrant and his grandfather was an immigrant. And so he's literally the son of an immigrant and yet he would be running as a poster boy for the guy pulling up the ladder. So there's that, that tension's always been, it's just always been there. Um, maybe we should take a look at what we were calling some of the seeds of our discontents coming out of the, out of the 60s uh, that are manifested in uh, contemporary American politics. Um, our politics are very polarized today as we know, uh, and they've become theatrical. I'll, I'll just very briefly say, you know, that that actually comes out of the mid 1960s. There was always an element of theatricality in American politics. It isn't a creation of the 1960s, but the party purity that we're dealing with today in many ways as a result, uh, the unintended consequences of a couple of things that happened in the 1960s. I don't know, does that make any sense, Phil? Um, yeah, I think, I think it does. The, another way I think of putting that is, and this is what I tell my students, like when I started teaching, so you know, roughly 20 some years ago, um, I'd often talk about po political parties in the United States as, as not being particularly ideological, and having wings, you know, liberal wings, conservative wings, and um, uh, and they tended to fight within the 50 yard line, to use a football metaphor, right? And that people's political party identification was maybe inherited from their parents or wasn't something they necessarily were really strongly attached to. 
And that's just not the world we're in now. Now people are deeply attached to their political ideology. We're not, not sure, even on not, not so much even ideology, just the political affiliation. Um, and the, particularly the way primaries work in the United States today, it's it's often about party purity. Um, and a lot of that does seem, see, I yeah, probably a lot of it does come and come out of the 60s, um, 60s, early 70s, the sort of Nixon experience, the 68, 72, uh, 76 election cycles. One of the things that um, I've thought about uh, in terms of party purity is it, it's always surprised. In fact, I had one person recently uh, at, a, at a presentation I was doing who was a little startled that there weren't primaries uh, presidential primaries were not decisive until really sometime in the middle late 1970s. And I said, no, the, 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 there were primaries. There were a handful around the country. I mean, the, the famous 1960 John F. Kennedy in West Virginia became a credible candidate because he won in West Virginia, but there weren't many. And so like 1968, the, the year that some people think is the hinge year on all of this, the year after which everything changed, uh, one of the questions uh, I frequently get asked is, could, had he lived, would Robert F. Kennedy have won the Democratic nomination? Because remember, he was assassinated uh, literally the very evening that he had just won the California primary. And, and the answer to that is, and I'm, there, there's a complex answer to that involving Richard Daley, but I think the short answer for the moment is probably not because there were no more primaries. There were only 18 primaries. Hubert Humphrey did not enter a single primary. Uh, Hubert Humphrey you know, worked the machine, so to speak. And one of the things that happened coming out of that after the, the horrendous convention in Chicago is the Democratic Party, or at least the then progressive version of it, uh, instituted direct presidential primaries that began in 1972. And that was the way in which you could only get the nomination, which you had, to, well, the Republicans at the time, not particularly seeing a problem in that, also agreed. And they changed their system to have a full, the full-blown primary system we have today. And the first time that happened, of course, is 1972, the Democrats nominated McGovern and he got buried by Nixon. And uh, whether, George McGovern was good, bad, or indifferent. He did probably represent at that time one of the more left. So what, what, why that leads to party purity, however, is, and I think Ben has, uh, has done a lot of reporting on this for the Erie Reader, is who votes in primaries? Uh, so it's super voters. Yeah, the super voters. Um, I have a... Um, well, most Erie people would know who I'm talking about. I'm not gonna name her, but my niece is very uh, prominent in local politics. And she asked me if I would do some phone calling or this, that for, and she gave me a stack of names. I said, who are these people? And she says, these are the super voters. Uh, these are the people who vote all the time. Well, super voter is a nice neutral way of saying the highly committed. And of course, they don't represent a majority. And as our politics has gotten more extreme and fewer people actually vote in primaries, the super voters, the really dedicated ones are the ones who are decisive and they don't necessarily represent the center or the, the consensus. I don't know, does that make sense, Phil? Yeah, I think it does. Um... Hey, I'm also thinking for the record, I'm probably a super voter. So yeah, I am too, uh, actually. I'm a super voter. And I don't think that I'm doctrinaire, but <laughs> well, I think the question is, is what are they what are the super voters committed to? So it goes to your question of polarization and party purity, because if they're committed to a certain ideological position or they're single issue voters or whatever. That's one thing, but if they're committed to the idea of democracy, if they're voting because they think people should vote, so I think it sort of comes down to the question of if they're super voters, what's their motivation for being super voters? Um, I think I think it opens up a lot of um, a lot of questions there about that, and it also opens up the question of what's the purpose of the political party? Is the purpose of the political party to represent is the people in it? 
or is the purpose to curate uh, uh, and put forward candidates that do go to the center? That right? Like, is it like what's the purpose of the political party? Is there a responsibility to the party to step in and say this person's unfit for office or that person's a better? Do they have a role in it, or is it just purely a democratic process? Well, you know, that's a good question. And I would ask Ben if, go back to our comments on media that we were touching on earlier. And again, you'll see how, well, although we have this nice outline that I, I showed as a slide at the beginning, all of these topics interlace and overlap. Um, one of the things that's happened with the proliferation of media is and the relative inexpensiveness of contemporary, and I emphasize the word relative inexpensiveness of contemporary media is that you can make the argument that, and this ties into one of the other topics on our, our right up on this screen about politics as entertainment, candidates, particularly candidates who might have at one time been perceived as marginal can end run the whole party apparatus, essentially rendering the party apparatus I'm not going to say you're relevant, but less relevant. Does that make sense, Ben? Yeah. So, Andy, I think I think what you're what you're touching on is that traditionally, uh, what, once we see the primaries have a role in the election cycle, we see uh, candidates campaigning uh, closer to fringes, a little bit more extreme during the primaries, just as an effort to stand out. And then, after a candidate is victorious in the primary, they drift back toward the center. I think back to what Phil was talking about earlier, using the football metaphor. If you're playing for that center ground, you're at the 50 yard line. You're really trying to draw in as many people as you as you can can. But because of today's media saturation, we're not seeing candidates drift toward a center after emerging victorious in a primary, because whatever worked in the primary during a media cycle will continue to work or might continue to work. And we, we've seen that happen with various candidates. And we see that happen with candidates who are running on character, you know, less than policy. You know, we're not talking about specific immigration policy or specific, uh, specific uh, fiscal policy, but really just character. Who is this person and do they stand out? And I think that elevates to what you're talking about, the celebrity factor of politics these days. And back to what Ailes said is that, you know, after Nixon, all other politicians would simply be entertainers. They're people that captivate us. They're people that we see on glowing rectangles, big and small, and that that's, they, they speak to us in a sense that we are entertained. We see them as entertainers and we tend to just think character and we think policy second, we think, you know, political ideology second. And, and I'm, I'm painting with a very broad brush saying the we here, but it, 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 I think it illustrates the idea that it's a shift in one, how politicians run, and then two, then if elected, how politicians end up governing, because it's not as if the media cycle ends once they're in office. And, and yeah. we see now, I think, a more pronounced, uh, there's the old adage that in the Senate you have uh, workhorses and show horses. You have the workhorses who are getting legislation done, proposing bills and pushing them forward. Then you have show horses, the ones that are the ones in front of the media. We're seeing fewer people, I think, run for office wanting to be the workhorses and get the work done. And we're seeing more people want to be the show horses. And, and we see now that any sort of media interaction can be a bump in campaign financing, that you use that as a fundraising moment and then bring in more dollars just to simply run again and continue to get more limelight. So in a way, it, it's a cycle that feeds itself of if I say something that's going to get me 15 seconds on air and it's going to get a viral tweet, I'll see more things that are going to do that and focus more on the message than the actual work at hand. Yeah, and I think that's all true. And I think that's one of the things, uh, again, an unintended consequence that, uh, and we'll talk about that a little later when we get to the slide on media. But I think this notion of party purity is also tied into something, I think it was H.W. Brands who um, is a, 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 a really qu uh, quality writer uh, he wrote a book, well, he's written numerous books, but he wrote a book called The Strange Death of American Liberalism, a short book. And he wrote that right around uh, the Tea Party time, right around 2010. And he pointed out that American politics used to be about the contested middle, that in any election, there would be 40% would be left, 40% would be right. And, and the entire uh, electoral campaign is about that 20% in the middle. Well, two or three things have happened. One, that middle, I think, has shrunk. 
I'm not going to get into percentages. But a second thing that has happened is, and, and recently I've noticed a number of commentators talking about the potential of a third party. Now, third parties have historically not fared well in our system. It's not structured for third parties, actually. But they're making the point that part of the reason is that larger and larger numbers of people have declared themselves independent, which depending on the state in which you reside means you may or may not be able to vote in a primary. So back to the party purity and the super voters, uh, and I like Phil, I think, and Ben, I, I think all three of us would qualify as super voters on the strict definition that we vote all the time. Hopefully, I think we're a little more flexible and uh, thinking about what's going on. But that means that those centrist people who I'm, I'm making an assumption here that could be wrong, and I'd like to hear you guys' opinion. If, if, if the people who are declaring themselves to be independents are primarily the people who once would have been descri described as the centrists, super voters or not, that then leaves in the primary a larger and larger portion of the people left voting in primaries are the true believers, uh, which gives a powerful voice. And so there's you know, a lot of talk now about open primaries. I know in Pennsylvania, uh, Erie's own Senator Dan Lachlan is, and he's a Republican, is sponsored a bill, I don't know where it is at the moment in the state Senate, that to adjust the Pennsylvania pro way to open primaries. Uh, it's a little more nuanced than that, that you would, you, you'd have, you don't have to change your registration, but you could, you'd have to declare uh, that you're going to vote, and this time you're going to vote in the Republican primary and not the Democratic or vice versa. Uh, other states are dealing with completely open primaries. And then you have other options like ranked choice voting, et cetera, et cetera. Because a lot of people have begun to see that the primary system, which started out as a way of opening the process up, may have inadvertently closed the process down. Uh, in the interest of time, we did worry that we'd have too much here and uh, we're only on the third or fourth slide. Uh, ben touched on it. Would either of you want to comment on what Roger Ailes meant about politics as entertainment? Well, I think it's what we've been talking about is it's the, I mean, it's the rise of mass media. Um, and then you hit television and you hit cable news and it's mass media on steroids is what he's talking about. It's, it's you know, the 24 hour news cycle. It's everything Ben was talking about. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it, it, it moves towards people who um, don't really talk about issues, but sell themselves, as Ben mentioned earlier, they become personalities. And of course, that feeds right into the culture wars by staking out inflammatory positions. Um, and and we're, we see that in, um, I'm not so sure about New York at the moment, uh, for our our viewers, Phil is actually located in New York, and at the moment, Ben is in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and of course, I'm still in Erie looking at Pennsylvania politics, where we have a senatorial race in which both candidates, and I'm not going to, well, I guess most people watching this would have a pretty good idea which of the two I would support, but that's neither here nor there. Um, both candidates are mediagenic people. They're flamboyant. Uh, one of whom is a television celebrity uh, who doesn't happen to be a Pennsylvanian, except maybe in the strictest technical sense. Uh, and the other, who is a Pennsylvanian, in, inarguably, uh, but is um, a personality. He's also got policy positions, and he, he'll make them known. And so you have a senatorial race, which is really a um, an offshoot of show business at the moment. Is that, am, am I overstating that, Ben? No, not, not at all, Andy. And, and, and it's an important distinction to draw is that you have somebody who has <clears throat> literally been a celebrity 
in in this race and then somebody who through politics has been has become a celebrity so john fetterman certainly achieved celebrity status uh you know he has been uh on the cover of rolling stone uh the mayor of hell a story about braddock and and that's you know a, a decade plus ago and so he's been a darling of the media for a while but it's because of his governing um you know Mehmet Oz hosted a TV show and, you know, a syndicated TV show. And so we, we see two people that have come at their celebrity differently uh, vying for a Senate seat and now trying to run campaigns actively around who they are and their characters and, and a rebranding. I think one of the most interesting things is there was a recent post out um, looking at Fetterman's tactics and, you know, could he essentially, in another vulgar term, uh, you know, blank post his way to winning? And it was a sim it was simply talking about his use of social media and the fact that it's worked because he's picked up on one thing, that Mehmet Oz is not a resident of Pennsylvania. By, like you said, Andy, you know, by technical definition, he is and he's running, but, but he's lived in New Jersey. He's lived in you know, many other places. But Fetterman's picked up on that and just run with it and hammered that point. And, it, and it's really been a character statement for Fetterman of I am Pennsylvania, I am with you, I am, I am more authentic. It, it's not a policy position. And, you know, it's interesting to see this race because Fetterman somebody who doesn't come off as a typical politician or somebody that may have studied politics, but yet he's Harvard educated in, in public yeah. policy and, and he he's governed before and he's done so effectively. Uh, and, and this isn't the only race, you know, this is this isn't the only race where you see celebrity factor, you know, just, you know, look right to the left of Pennsylvania into Ohio and you see J.D. Vance, you know, someone who came to fame from writing a memoir that, you know, created that furthered the monolith of Appalachia to say that, you know, the hill hillbilly elegy is everyone's story it wasn't it isn't we know that but yet he's made such a market pivot into a character and now is running on that and and you know it, it's just remarkable to see uh you know how this is going to continue playing out that we get actual celebrities running and of course again this is the first time we've seen movie stars in politics we, you know, we had a president yeah. that was a movie star and, and that's ronald reagan yeah, and donald trump uh, was a major television star i mean people mm -hmm. tend to forget that and uh in fact, I've, a, a number of the Wall Street Journal, uh, hardly a, um, a bastion of progressivism, the Wall Street Journal has repeatedly pointed out uh, that Trump was essentially a failed real estate developer, that most of his fortune comes from the television program. Uh, the Trump family, that is to say, the, fa the, 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 the real estate empire his father left, that still exists, but Trump does not have a lot to do with running that anymore. Uh, and, and you're right, so Andy, Ronald Reagan. Andy, if I could make one one other point that I think is important to note in this conversation of the celebrities, I, I do believe there's there's actually more attention being paid on on Pennsylvania, um, and I think it's for two reasons. One, people have identified it as a purple state and and see it as a potential swing state now. And in could the Democrats pick up a, a Senate seat? You know, uh, Senator Pat Toomey is retiring, a Republican. Could they actually gain a seat in the Senate by winning Pennsylvania? But I think because of Fetterman's exposure, especially through the 2020 election as well, I mean, he was on uh, he was on on on, you know, uh, uh, stations often talking about the election, what was happening in Pennsylvania and, and really became a, a, a bigger media darling during it. Yeah. But the, the dual celebrity fact, uh, the dual celebrity nature of having two people, you know, representing two parties, I think there's more attention being paid to that race. And I think it's important to note because in Ohio, a lot of talks just around J.D. Vance. Tim Ryan's no slouch. And, and people have, you know, I think that at large, media seems to have more easily written off a state like Ohio because of J.D. Vance and his celebrity nature. And they tend to forget that, that Tim Ryan is very much running as a Sherrod Brown style Democrat and that Ohio has elected Sherrod Brown. Why would they not elect a, a, a Tim Ryan? It's also possible. So but Tim Ryan's a politician. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, go ahead. Jump in here real quick. I think to, to sort of bring together some of these threads with the politics of theater and angry partisanship, that the discussion of politicians as celebrity, meaning they have their own base, they raise money nationally, et cetera, et cetera, um, further points to the weakening of political parties and their ability, the ability of political parties to mitigate control of the situation, like the however party elders. Um, and then the other thing about it is the, the angry partisanship part, I think goes to the point where if you become so vested in, in your, your team's jersey and you become so angry about it and you're in a media bubble, 
Yeah. Um, and that, that's like, that can lead to an erosion in a belief in a republic or a democracy or a democratic republic, however you want to phrase it, because every election becomes an existential crisis. It's not yeah, that, exactly. hey, I lost this election, but I'll win the next one, or here's my congratulations. Every election is the most important election ever in the history of all elections. Um, and that's yeah, and I think that's an today. excellent point that elections have become, particularly state and national elections. I'm not so sure that's true at the local level. And, you know, an interesting thing, I'm not so sure. I think it's percolating. Local politics can get pretty angry, but I don't know if local politics is particularly theatrical. Uh, I think it's maybe that's an interesting that observation. Um, I, I'm, I'm that's, I don't have any proof of that, but that's just finger to the wind. It yeah. seems like the national stuff is trickling down into the local yeah. stuff. Uh, for the audience, uh, the, where we got onto this is Roger Ailes made the comment after Nixon won in 1968 that Nixon be the last politician ever elected president, all the rest would be entertainers. And that was because Ailes uh, really perfected the, the, uh, the uh, adaptation of consumer packaged goods advertising to selling a candidate. In fact, there's a famous book, I think by Joe McGinnis, The Selling of the President, that talks about that whole dynamic. Yeah, that is that's 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 really um, really interesting. Is I, I look at the clock, and just as we feared, there's uh, too many topics, and the topics are too rich. Uh, let's take a quick look at a couple of more that that tie into uh, one of the phenomena that was one of one of the seeds of our discontents is that politics has become culture wars, it has become arguments over core values and less over specific policies. And in fact, one of the oddities is uh, if you can get people off camera, allegedly, uh, and talking about specific policies, you actually get rational discussions, even at the national level, uh, which might come as a surprise to some people. That doesn't mean they would rationally agree with one another. They might rationally disagree, but they actually have. But it's most of our politics is culture wars. And I think that takes us back to the two meta threads because the culture wars are about is the essential thread is 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 America the story of a certain subculture? Well, it was once the that's an interesting little psychological slip on my part maybe. Uh, it was once the dominant culture inarguably, and it is becoming a, a subculture. And it's become a subculture because of what happens over the next two or three slides. Uh, coming out of the '60s, of course, you have race in America. And one of the things, that the next slide is the women's movement. Uh, and then a slide after that's the counterculture. I'm gonna back up though now just to show this so people don't think we're... All three of those slides talk about cultural values. And one of the things that uh, I've said is the, the essentialist story says that America is white, Christian, patriarchal, not particularly democratic, uh, by, by which I mean small d. Uh, and that is not nearly as controversial a statement as some people might think because the constitution itself is not necessarily a democratic instrument, or at least as originally written. The civil rights, the civil war amendments might change that. The three, the, the, the protean story is about the attempt at self-government while all the time increasing the definition of who is the we. And that comes down to three groups of people, speaking in the broadest terms here, uh, race, gender, uh, and there's an interesting dynamic. The people who were excluded from inclusion have historically struggled, fought, argued for their inclusion by appealing to America's foundational values. The people who would exclude them either overtly deny those values or, I'm not gonna say covertly, that's the wrong word, or passively just dismiss them. And for example, when I say core values, I, I mean the American creed uh, the second paragraph of the Declaration of Independence, you know, every, every school child knows this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their creator with the right to uh, liberty, 
pro, uh, the pursuit of uh, equality, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. During the Civil War, and Phil can correct me if I'm wrong, Alexander Stevens, the vice president of the Confederacy, explicitly rejected the Declaration of Independence in his famous cornerstone speech. Most of the Southern states that seceded in their act of secession rejected it. Lincoln made it holy writ at Gettysburg. As recently as last, well, recently as two days ago, Henry Olson, who's a conservative, a Reagan conservative in the Washington Post, who uh, began his article by making the point that he is a conservative and that he finds much to agree with the Edmund Burke Society's uh, specific policies, but he takes exception to the fact that in their most recent declaration of values, they are silent on the core American values of liberty, equality, and opportunity, just not mentioned. And Olson, and I, I want to repeat for our audience, Olson's a conservative writer, uh, and he's upfront about all of that, uh, says he can't follow any group that does not make an explicit stand in defense of those foundational values. And I think one of the reasons I have, I respect Liz Cheney, who on every specific issue, I think we could, we could identify, she and I would probably disagree, except two. She believes in those three things I just said, liberty, equality, and opportunity, and she believes in the rule of law. So all of that comes to life in these next couple of slides on race in America and, and gender, in which the excluded uh, struggled for inclusion by appealing to our foundational rights. So anyways, my question uh, for, for either Ben or Phil, and I'm looking at the clock, we're, I think maybe we'll deal with this slide as best we can and then quickly show uh, the, the rest of them and say that if we decide to do follow-ups, we'll do deep dives into the others because we'll be here all night if we uh, if we go into each slide as as in deep as as deeply as we did the first one, we'll be here until tomorrow. Um, did, did what I said to back up the tape here, Phil or Ben? Did what I just the, the the macro outline I just made about inclusion? Did that make sense? Oh, I'll hop in. Um, I think by and large it does. I think you see. Well, I mean you certainly see these things coming to a head in the 1960s, right? But, but as you say, they, they've been uh, in the works for a long time. Like you could see a civil rights movement going back to well into the 19th century, um, coming out of essentially the abolitionist movement to sort of yeah. give a short answer. So I think that, yes, and then there's, there's like, particularly you have a picture of Dr. King up and he clearly is evoking, um, uh, the Declaration of Independence and basically telling Americans um, that you have to like live up to your values. And one of the things to think about with a movement like the Civil Rights Movement here is um, part of the reason the movement takes the shape it takes is because Black people have been excluded from power and they needed to convince white people who could vote or was at least much easier for them to vote to change their mind. And right. so there's, there's, there's that dynamic is at play. And that's going to, there's going to be a similar dynamic, um, not exactly the same, but there's going to be a similar dynamic with the women's movement as well, particularly yeah. for suffrage. Ben? Yeah, so I agree with what Phil said and Andy, I think this tees it up well to again talk about the exclusive version of America versus the inclusive version of America and in the inclusive version of America it's people simply fighting for the rights that America was supposedly founded on right the we we the people and, and back to who gets to say we who is part of the us versus who is excluded. And, and ever since the birth of the country, people have been excluded from that process. So over time, we look at people asking to be let into the process, fighting to be let into that process. And again, I think Phil's pointed out so well that, that the challenge is asking those who can vote to enable others to be also be able to vote. And I think part of the challenge of that is, is explaining to someone just because 
more people are at the table, that doesn't mean that the buffet has shrunk, you know, that it's not somehow less that the if the country is a pie, we're not baking the same size pie, we're baking a bigger pie, we're making more country, and we're becoming more rich and complex. And it is a country that's that has grown over time, it, it, it would make sense that, that we could see that, but some people don't that by letting others in, you're somehow restricting the access that those prior who had been let in had, and somehow that's less. They have less America to themselves because others have been let in. And, and we see that over a hundred years, you know, civil war to civil rights movement, a hundred years building in that process. And we see laws getting in the way of that, Jim Crow era getting in the way of that. You know, we, we see a, you know, a failed attempt to rebuild the South, all, all based out of an 1876 election gone awry, and then the North pulling up out of that and, and letting Jim Crow law slip back in and a, a, a population be marginalized. So more people want to be heard. And I think that goes right to what, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. had said multiple times of, you know, be true to what you said on paper, you know, and that was the call for that. And that more people could be in, included. And we see that just that tipping point happen in the 60s, you know, where it's finally pushed through. And we see, you know, the violence that comes with riots in cities, but we also see the accomplishments and the doors opening. But it's not as if there was a, you know, a, a, a switch flipped overnight and suddenly we just decided it was going to work because it takes convincing of people. And it takes convincing of culture, you know, and culture does not change overnight. That's something that takes time to change. And that's an ongoing conversation. So it's as if we're trying to weave the tapestry while we're trying to wear the tapestry as a country, while we're trying to weave more tapestry to continue wearing as we're growing as a country. You know, it, it's very tough to do that. And I think that that's where we get, you know, these these moments of inflection and challenge along the way is that people stop and say change is difficult or change is different, it's foreign than what I've known, without realizing that the idea of America has been foreign to marginalized populations who have been part of this country, not just for years or decades, but centuries. Literally from the beginning. I mean, literally from the beginning. Uh, yeah, and that's I, and that's that's something that you Andy, sorry to interrupt, but that's something you wrote about really well in, in the ongoing series in your book notes. When you talk about the American Tapestry Project, that's something that you've talked about as a, as a real challenge is is that, you know, from the very beginning, you know, we, we've all come from somewhere else, aside from the First Nations people that, you know, did come from somewhere else. But centuries ago, with the, then we pushed out of their country. But everyone came here from somewhere else, some by choice, some not by choice. And that's an important part of this conversation is that people were brought to this country that had had no no stake in the matter, that they were simply treated as property and chattel. And, and we have neglected that conversation for a very long time. We watched the founders struggle with it. They're struggling with it then and anticipating that those who come after them will address it and fix it. And here we are in 2022, still trying to work for equity and still equality for all. It. Exactly. Um, and I'm looking at the clock and I also see Raven, uh, if you can't see her, but I can see her, uh, is here to remind us that we're closing in on an hour and we're on the second slide and we could spend uh, a lot. I, I'm gonna quickly go through um, just to remind the people of the other topics. Uh, I agree, I mean, Phil and Ben are right. Uh, it was what Martin Luther King did say, it was the last speech he ever gave. It was the night before he was assassinated when he said, just be true to what you said on paper. And, and the key message that I, I wanna make here is that in both uh, the civil rights movement and the women's rights movement and indigenous peoples movement, and then later with different immigrant groups uh, arguing for their rights, they all argue for, they're not asking for anything other than that we be true to what we said we stand for. And there's a profound irony, and we can explore this, uh, but like Henry Olson pointed out, I'm gonna use a conservative columnist again to make a point that what you're seeing now on the, I'm not sure they even, they're not even conservatives. What you're seeing now on the radical right is the explicit rejection of, of those values. Uh, and we had to talk about how that happened, but we don't have uh, the time to do that today. Uh, if, if Phil and Ben are amenable and we'll figure out the scheduling with Raven and others at the Jefferson, we can continue this. Um, and I will make this pledge to anyone watching, but I'll also make the pledge to Phil and Ben that we'll I'll, I'll work on tightening this up. There's so much material 
that. But just really quickly, I mean, one of the things we'll look at in the future is women's rights in the 1960s morphed into women's liberation. Uh, and that topic is as hot as this week is because the last question there is Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health Center, the beginning of a reversal of that progress. And again, just as Phil and Ben said, the women who had been excluded, who didn't have the right to vote, made their pitch, if you will, their argument to be included by specifically referring to the core foundational values. And at the women's uh, first uh, rights meeting in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848, their statement of de their declaration of rights and sentiments was exactly modeled on the Declaration of Independence. We'll talk about the counterculture and how, I mean, the, 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 to my mind, it is still kind of somewhat bizarre how the 1960s do your own thing and morphed into a kind of neo Ayn Randian hyper individualism. Uh, they're just the obverse and reverse of the same thing. We'll talk about a book David Brooks wrote. Uh, under all of this is music. Uh, I think one of the great things that happened in the 1950s or 60s was that I'm using rock and roll here to talk about all of popular music in some ways. It brought back the diversity of American culture. We've touched, uh, it just scratched the surface on, on to the extent that media created America uh, and, and continues to shape it. And then of course, my notion of the fusion thread of course is the protean story. And uh, I, I think actually, uh, what did Winthrop mean by a city upon a hill? That phrase is in his famous uh, sermon, a model of Christian charity. What, what no one particularly on the right comments afterwards is after he says that law, he doesn't mean that we're going to be, oh, look at us, aren't we uh, glorious? No, he was a covenanter. He's, he meant we will be like a city on a hill, exposed to the eyes of God and exposed to all people. And they will know if we've been true to the values we espouse. Now, he was talking specifically about, um, uh, I'm going to call it a, a, a Puritan Christian view. But he has been adopted or by people as to say that, well, I'm going to adapt Winthrop just a little bit. Yeah, we'll be as we are a city on a hill and people all over the world are watching to see if we're as faithful to our own values as uh, we ought to be. I don't know any any last comments, Ben or Phil, and then I'll throw it back to Raven, who I think is telling us we need to draw this to a conclusion. And I thank everyone for listening and watching. Uh, I don't see any questions at the moment, but if you see this later, uh, please. Uh, Feel free to ask questions, make comments, and should we decide to turn this into an ongoing series, uh, we'll absolutely take your comments and questions to heart as we uh, try to stylize this and make it a little more, maybe significantly more uh, precise and focused. Phil, Ben? Um, yeah, this is, these are huge topics, so it's going to be very hard <laughs> to cover them in a short amount of time. Um, yeah, I think maybe put them all under the umbrella of discussing citizenship, uh, maybe. Yeah, I'm putting them under the umbrella of, if I heard you correctly, citizenship, I mm -hmm. think that's that's actually a, a great idea. What does it mean to be, a, what are the rights and obligations and who gets to be included and how has that changed over time, Ben? Yeah, I, I think Phil is spot on here, and and I think that you know to, to tell the American story assumes one must be American, right? Because we're we're not talking about other countries' histories, we're not talking about other countries' cultures, we're talking about our own, and, and it's something that you know the, the three of us were you know born into being American, and here we are talking about it. But to tell the story, one must be part of the story. So looking at citizenship and who who officially gets to be a part of that story, I think is you know an important thing. And, I, and if I can, I'll just share a quick little anecdote that I think gave me a little bit of hope and op restored optimism. And I, I'm, I, I am an optimistic person, and I'm still full of hope. And I think that the country's brighter days still lie ahead. I don't think we're you know steer, steering ourselves off a cliff. Uh, for Fourth of July, I had the chance to, to go down to Mount Vernon and uh, took some family there. And we were walking around. 
And they actually did a naturalization ceremony on the 4th of July at Mount Vernon. And one of the moments that I got to see was a, a new American stand in front of George Washington Mansion with documentation and take a picture. And I, and I thought, you know, how American is this? That somebody still wants to be a part of this and, and is there on the birthday of the nation and taking a picture in front of a, a mansion that was built and run by slaves, you know? And so it's such a, 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 a history fraught with challenges, with contradictions, but yet it's something that people still want to be a part of and something people still want to discuss. And then it's that right to be an American, to tell the story and to be part of it. So I, I think Phil is spot on there with looking at citizenship and who, who gets to be in and who do we let in? And then what version of ourselves do we want to be? Those of us already in are part of those who get to decide who gets to be in, right? You know, so I think that's the competing narratives. And the more that we can tell, you know, which narrative we think we're headed toward, I think the the more we steer our country into that more perfect union that the founders intended and that we are trying to still 200 year, 200 plus years later, improve upon. And that we're still experimenting as a democracy, and then we're going to get better. Thank you. Raven? Well, thank you all for this conversation. The story of America truly is very vast, and it sounds like we are going to have more, um, or we're going to need more conversations in the future. And we did talk about that. We kind of, we kind of knew that that was going to happen. Um, <laughs> but we love that. We love deep conversations. So we hope to see you all in the future as we have more conversations about the history of America and um, the American tapestry. So thank you to our presenters, Phil Payne, Andy Roth. And, and, oops, sorry, <laughs> and Ben Spagan for, um, for this digital program this afternoon. If anyone has any questions as they see this later on, feel free to email us. Um, you can email me, Clark at jeserie.org. Um, thank you for watching. And this has been the Jefferson Educational Society. Thank you. <laughs>